The game ended in the 17th inning last night with Paige Lowry striking out Kaylee Kavistad. Back to Lowry, over to first. Oklahoma goes back to back to win its fourth national championship. This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. All right, Paige, welcome to the Moonlight Graham Show. We are happy to have you here. You are only the second female to ever enter in as a moonlighter into the Moonlight Graham Show studio. Wow. So thank you for joining us. <laughs> I'm honored. Thank you for having me. Paige, now June 6th, 2017, national championship game. You are on the mound for the Oklahoma Sooners. What was that day like for you? Well, we had just played a 17-inning game the night before. And Did you game, pitch in that 17-inning game? Yes, I pitched 10 out of the 17 innings. So <laughs> I pitched the first five, took seven off, and then pitched the last five. Hold on, so. hold on. I did not realize this. So in college softball, there's a re-entry rule? Yes, so the starter can come back in. So like high school. That's a high mm-hmm. school baseball rule in yeah. Iowa where the starters can re-enter. Yeah. So, so softball has that, softball, huh? softball, yeah. So I came back in after seven innings of sitting. Okay, hold on. Let's let's go back then. I was not prepared for this. So you start the game, throw the first five innings. What's your mindset like after you get taken out after five innings? Because I'm a baseball pitcher. In baseball, if you get taken out, you literally hit the showers sometimes. You know, you relax, you ice up the arm, you 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 know, you cool down and you know, start mentally getting ready for your next outing. But you gotta be ready to go back in in softball. I mean, I was ready for anything my junior year because I actually started closing towards the end of the year, and I was just strictly a closer. And then randomly, since I had not started for a month and a half, they were like, Paige, we're going to throw him off, and you're starting this game. (laughs) So that was a whole thing in itself, too. And I got prepared to start, and then they were going to bring the other Paige, Paige Parker. They were going to bring her in for the last two innings, and we just expected it to be a seven-inning game. So it was like right. switch roles that game, basically. Yep. Then the game kept going and going, and Paige pitched seven innings, and it was the 12th inning. They were like, okay, Paige, I think it's time to bring you back in. Since- and so you got to <laughs> get loose all over again. Yeah, but I only had a batter. They are like, you're going to next batter. I'm like, all right. I was eating gummy worms at the time. <laughs> yeah. I remember. <laughs> That's like one of the one things I remember from that game. I was like, I was eating gummy worms in the 12th inning. They're like, you're going in next batter. So I sprint to the bullpen. There was no catcher. Threw a ball into the fence and went back in. Unbelievable. <laughs> and it must have went well. It- we uh, Well, we almost lost in the bottom of the 12th. I gave up a double when I came in to almost lose. But we ended up getting out of it. They tied the game back up, so the game kept going. But I ended up not giving up any runs after that, and we won seven to five. You won seven to five. Was that like a late game? Did it get over like it way late? It was six at hours. Night? Yeah. Oh my god. So then we played the next championship game the next day. So you had to turn around and play the deciding game the following day, mm-hmm. and you're exhausted. But at the same time, you got to be just running on adrenaline. Yeah, because- I remember not being sore at all. We ha- we took ice baths at the minor league stadium there, but we were just high on adrenaline. Oh my gosh. So yeah, what is it like then? that adrenaline feeling closing down a national championship game? Well, it's the best of three. So we had won the first game. So we knew that if we won that second game, we were the national champions. So I came in to close that second game and I was just like, do whatever it takes. Like just go in there and try to dominate as much as possible. We were up by one run. So I'm like, don't give up any runs and just get this game over with, please. (laughs) (laughs) Do you replay that moment in your head? I don't remember it. That's the really? thing. Yeah. Now I always say that I try to take I try to take all the emotion out of it because it was my childhood dream. So I just tried to like not think about the highs and the lows of it and just stay really neutral. And so with that, I think I just kind of lost the memory of it. But I go back and watch. I'm like, oh yeah, that did happen. And I mean, I I gained some things back, but I don't really remember the exact moment of it happening, which is kind no of kidding. weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you probably watch the game film and remember it more from rewatching the game mm-hmm, film than exactly. actually being on the on exactly. the circle in the circle. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Yeah. So let's awesome. take it back a little bit because you grew up in Dallas Center, went to Dallas Center Grimes, legendary high school softball player here in Iowa. When was the first time you played softball? I played well. I played t ball when I was really young, like four years old, and then I just continued going into softball. And I started pitching when I was nine, I think. So. 
My yeah. mom was a high school pitcher, and she was pretty good, so she kind of took me into pitching. Was your mom left-handed, too? No, she's not. But my sister is, and she plays at Minnesota right now, and my brother is also left-handed. So all the kids are left-handed. What but, are the odds? Yeah, but my parents are both right-handed. So was it hard for your mom to teach you because she's a righty and you're a lefty? She just shipped me off to coaches. She never <laughs> she never tried to teach me, but she always like tries to brag about her high school days. So right. well, apparently she's pretty good. All parents do. Yeah. Right? <laughs> all parents do. Well... You are probably, I was looking at your stats today, and you're probably the most decorated athlete we've ever had on here. I mean, your stats are just absolutely insane. In high school, you had 124 wins. Your ERA was under one in five years of softball. You had, I actually had to fact check this like multiple times. (laughs) You had 1,415 strikeouts in your career. Like that's just absolutely (laughs) insane. Now, the body of work of, you know, in high school is crazy. Did you ever just get exhausted having to pitch all those games? I don't think physically. I've just been conditioned to pitching that much. But mentally, I did put a lot of pressure on myself throughout high school because I wanted to be the best. And I knew that I was preparing to play D1 college. So I was like, I have to get these people out if I'm going to get SEC, if I'm going to get the best hitters in the nation out, then I have to get all these high school batters out. No, So I did put a lot of pressure on myself. So it was more mentally exhausting than it was physically, but all of it was just... Yeah, because not only did you probably have a lot of pressure from yourself, Mm -hmm. thinking, I got to get SEC hitters out, I got to get Big 12 hitters out one Mm -hmm. day, but you were like the best pitcher in the state as a freshman, right? And so everybody knew who Paige Lowry was Mm -hmm. when you were 14 and 15 years old. And we always got everyone's best game no matter what. Totally. Everyone was just geared up. Did that put a lot of pressure on you as a 14, 15 year old? I would say so. Yeah. And I think that this, the whole city and I think my coach and my parents and just everyone kind of put that a little bit of pressure on me too. And I just, I just always felt it on me. Yeah. You got to be the best. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. That's tough for, especially, I feel like softball is a little bit different. Now correct me if I'm wrong, but I've always felt softball was one of the first sports to really get organized at the youth level. Like traveling Mm -hmm. softball teams have been around for a long time. And now I think baseball and AU basketball has caught up to it a little bit. But when I was young, it seemed like the softball programs for girls that were like in third, fourth grade were way more organized in traveling than all of like the boys sports. Did you have it that way too? I would agree, yeah. And it's actually bigger than other states than Iowa, too. Iowa is the only state that plays high school softball in the summer. So people in other states play travel ball all through the summer, and that's how they get recruited, actually. Right. So it's just like they're with a travel team their whole entire lives. But for me, I kind of bounced around with different travel teams, and I was always just a little bit better. So I was on, like, just kind of elite teams, I would say. I just bounced around a little bit. But. Yeah, and that's similar to baseball. Mm-hmm. You know, that's it kind of puts a lot of high school kids at a disadvantage because they get recruited later because of summer mm-hmm. baseball, and there aren't as many well-developed travel teams. So when did you start doing the travel team circuit? Um, I think we were on a travel team from the beginning of my softball career, and we were all together for like five years. I okay. was with just a team out of Grimes, and one of my best friends, was the, the dad was the coach, so... We were together for about five years, and then I started bouncing around other teams. So the beginning of your softball yeah, career, was, which is like third grade yeah, or fifth grade? Yeah, I would say grade? second or third grade. Okay. Yeah. So pretty early on. Were mm-hmm. you guys always good? Yeah, we were really good. We won state all the time. Like, I don't I don't really remember a lot of things from back then, but I know that we were really good. Yeah. Did your little sister come up and play with you guys, too? She wasn't old enough, but and she kind of was a late bloomer, I would say. But So that's probably what made high school fun for you because you got a chance to play with your younger sister right Yeah, I got to play with my younger sister and I got to play with all my best friends so we were just really close off the field and on the field we had really good chemistry so it was just easy to play together nice now I'm from Fort Dodge right and Fort Dodge is you know the mecca of Iowa high school softball because Uh, the state softball tournament has been there for so many years right now and as a native Fort Dodger we're pretty proud of that so as somebody who didn't grow up in Fort Dodge, what was it like coming to Fort Dodge to play softball? Oh, it was the best environment <laughs> ever. And I was, okay, everyone always asks me, like, how do you get prepared to play SEC softball as a freshman? I'm like, that state softball tournament, I'm telling you, like, there's thousands of people there. They come and watch, and it's like you're playing in a huge college game almost. It's a big deal. It is. And there's a ton of people there. And I just, I felt that pressure kind of like a big college game there. Yeah, was it ever fun or was it just a lot of pressure? Because that state softball scene, there are literally, 
I don't know, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of people all around every one of those fields. And I've always thought, wow, what an environment for these teenage girls to perform in. And part of it's got to be really, really fun to be on that stage and to be the center of the attention. But also, you know, you got to perform. And if, if you're really serious about your softball career, it's got to be a lot. Yeah. Well, we first made it to state when I was a freshman and we got third that year and I pitched terribly my first two outings ever at the state tournament. I let the pressure get to me. I let the crowd get to me. And also I was still um, going through recruiting and I had a couple of really big college coaches watching me there. So that whole year I didn't do great. But then after that, I was like, let's just go out and have fun. We know we're good. And then we ended up getting second the next year and first my junior and senior year. Awesome. So I think those years we just knew that we were super good. And I was just like, why, why waste all these fears and why like just go out there and just play with my heart. Right. So when did you choose Missouri? When or why? Yeah. Um, I chose them my freshman year and I didn't really put too much thought into it. I think I always say that I just chose it because they were a good program and they were pretty close to home. Uh huh. Um, I visited Arizona and UCLA a couple of times and those were kind of my little dream schools growing up and, I ended up just going to Missouri because I knew it was close enough to home, but not too close. And I didn't put too much thought into it. And I was also 13. Right. So I didn't even know what I wanted to be when I grew up and I still don't necessarily, but <laughs> we're <laughs> all I figuring was 13, it out. I was like, I don't know. I just want to go to that best school. Cause they're top 10. Yeah. Yeah. Because you mentioned sec. Was it, you know, they're the closest sec school because I think mm-hmm. softball and Correct me if I'm wrong. It's largely dominated by SEC and Pac-12. Yeah, I would say that it's starting to be a little more balanced throughout the nation, but the SEC has all of the 13 programs in the SEC are in the top, I would say, 40. So Mm -hmm. they're like very balanced, I would say. Right. So I was just really interested in that and knowing that I was going to be playing really good competition every weekend. Every weekend. It's Mm -hmm. some of the best teams in the country. And there's huge exposure, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, down south, they take their sports pretty seriously. Yeah, the SEC Network, we were always on TV. Everyone could always watch. So that was really cool, too. Now, the probably most famous moment from your career down at Missouri was you get struck in the face with a line drive. Yes. And every pitcher, no matter baseball, softball, that's like the one thing that people have nightmares about is getting hit in the face. Mm -hmm. And I've been hit by a baseball everywhere in my body except for the face. And I could hardly watch the replay of you getting hit. Do you remember that, or is that one of those things you don't remember, too? I do not remember one second of it. No and that's kidding. what helped me kind of get over it, I think, is the fact that I don't remember it. I actually got knocked out, and a lot of people – I did a documentary about it with Flow Softball, and that's when I first started talking about it. But I haven't really talked about it much in, in the public light, but I actually did get knocked out and don't remember anything for the next two hours after I got hit. So, You know, I saw that, and, you know, there's pictures of – their, your black eye and everything mm-hmm. you posted something on social media shortly after that so everybody thought you were doing okay but i watched a little bit of the flow documentary and i, I read some of the articles and i just, i couldn't believe you went back in the game it was not my choice i mean maybe it was but not knowing it was i know i was begging to go back in but i don't recall any of it so i mean it's it's just yeah, one it is of those what situations it is. it's like one of those sports culture things when you, you want to be back out on the field and everyone wants you back out on the field. So it yeah. wasn't handled the right way, but it happened. Totally. You're you're probably a 19 year old girl at the time mm-hmm. and you get hit in the face with a line drive. And like you said, it's one of those sports competitive situations where of course the competitive athlete is going to say, I want to be in coach, keep me in the game, mm-hmm. you know, concussions in football. We're seeing the same thing. Yeah. And like, where were the adults or the coaches to be like, Hey, I think with your, best interest in mind you just got hit by a 100 mile an hour line drive that's the thing my best interest wasn't considered there so yeah and so the way you say that is was this one of the major reasons you end up transferring from missouri yeah i mean i would say that's the biggest reason i transferred but it was just that culture in general just knowing that my best interest and our well-being wasn't placed in the forefront yeah and you weren't the only one that had issues with you know the coaching staff at mizzou at that time what and in sports, you know, there's a there's a fine line between constructive criticism and getting chewed out and, and that being productive and abuse mm-hmm. and verbal abuse. So, you know, how did you know it at the line had been crossed at Missouri? I just think that all of us didn't feel very good about ourselves physically and mentally. 
And so just like locker room talk and just how we felt, we just kind of all decided like, hey, we're not being treated right. And the people that felt strongly enough about it ended up leaving. And some people really did like him and some people absolutely hated him. So, I mean, when people ask me, I'm like, I'm not to say that you'd like him or you'd hate him, but my personal experience, I did not get treated well. So Right. And that had to be tough to make that move to leave too. That's a big mm-hmm. decision. Yeah, it was really hard. You know, for you, you're, you're young at that time. You've had plenty of success. I mean, you had two really successful years mm-hmm. at Mizzou in the SEC, tons of accolades, and you make the move uh, to transfer to Oklahoma, who, mm-hmm. you know, great program as well. Why Oklahoma? I took some visits, and I think at the end of the day, I was just – I wanted to go somewhere that I felt like – my well-being was placed at the forefront and that they really did care about me as a person more than as a player. And it was nice knowing that they were good too, but I just felt that they were really genuine on my visit. And I only, pl- I only went on four visits and I went to places that I thought that people would treat me right. So mm-hmm. I ended up thinking Oklahoma was the best fit for me physically and mentally. Yeah. And it, did you, did that prove out to be right? Obviously. Yeah, I know. I mean, from, from my vantage point, you know, you go there and they already have a great team. Mm-hmm. And then Paige Lowry comes there and you're like this secret weapon. You start some games, but mostly you become this ace closer for them. You set all sorts of big 12 records, school records for most saves. What was that like taking on a new role as a pitcher at Oklahoma? I think like going through tough things mentally prepared me for it because closing that's the main component is having mental toughness. So I was really prepared for any situation. I was thrown in in the middle of a bat sometimes, in the middle of innings, when people were on second and third base with no outs in the seventh inning, things like that. And I think just like my mental game and where I've been in life has helped. Like it helped me completely. Right. So I felt really prepared. So you, you've mentioned, you know, mental preparation quite a bit. And I just saw recently you had this, you had a post on social media and about mental health, mm-hmm. which I thought was really cool. Because I was listening to this podcast. Um, it's actually a local podcast called High Heels and Briefcase. And it's, it's by this girl that I know. And she had my wife on as her guest. And it struck me as I was listening to their podcast, they were talking about how social media affects women. And girls. And I, it didn't really hit me until I heard my wife and her friend talking about how not everybody out there, not all women are trying to build up other women. And some are looking to tear them down and how that can affect them and how social media affects them. And it struck me after you posted something about mental health online, too, that, man, I don't know if guys totally get it, what it's like to be a girl and to behave and to live in this social media world. Um, you know, what is that like? I mean, I think women just in general have a beauty standard from men and women, from everybody. And what we see on social media is just a vague representation of a person. And we only see all the good things about people and we just get jealous. And we see all the bad parts of our life maybe. And then we see all these good parts of other people's lives. And we're like, why don't I have this? Why don't I look like this? You're constantly comparing. You're just constantly comparing. And I think that just takes a toll on everybody. And I think it can be the same for men. But I think just a higher level, like beauty standards for women are just always placed super high for yeah, men and women. It's definitely different, I feel like, for women, though. Um, and you, you have a blog that I thought was really good. And the first line of your blog said, social media does a great job of highlighting the greatest parts of one life, one's life while masking the darkness. Mm-hmm. I was like, whoa, that's, that's <laughs> deep. That's Thank deep. You. And it's got to be tough for you because not only are you a softball player and a great softball player, but you're also a role model, right? And you're a role model for so many young girls. And, you know, girls don't have as many role models as guys do from an athletic standpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, guys, they can watch the NFL, the Major League Baseball, and the NBA and college sports are bigger. But in girls' sports, there aren't as many. And so it's bigger. It's a bigger emphasis for g- girls like you that are so successful. Is that part of your mission now, now that you're playing professionally and part of team USA and you're out of softball to be that role model? Yeah. I think that the beginning of my career, I was kind of like, I did struggle with mental health a little bit, but I was like, I have to pretend like I'm perfect. I have to get the most followers, get the most likes, look like I'm just like having the best time of my life just to mask it. But I think that being vulnerable and like telling the truth about myself and just being a genuine person is my mission now because I want people to be able to look up to the real me and not just 
that representation of myself that I try to put out there. Right. So. Yeah. Because, it, and it's hard to be vulnerable sometimes as an athlete, right? Because mm -hmm. You have to be tough. You got to be out there to compete and, you know, you got to be invincible as a pitcher. Sometimes, yeah. you know, you got to have this mindset. What's amazing when, as I'm looking through your career is the big games you always performed, you know, in the postseason all the time in the conference tournaments and the NCAA tournaments, when you were on the mound, you always performed And that, you know, that takes a lot of mental toughness. Did you feel like you had to step it up in those, you know, the big moments? I didn't really feel like I had to step it up. I just felt like I had to be myself and not try to be too much. I think that when I try to be too much on the field, that's when I don't do well. But when I just put emotions aside and just throw my pitch and throw to the batter's weakness, then I can just I can be my best. Right. Yeah. If you try to be anything outside of yeah. what you are, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. That's always my mission. So what is it about lefty pitchers in softball? I don't know. I think we have some weird movement and lefties seem to be good at curveballs for some reason. Everyone always talks about the lefty curveball and lefty lefty matchups and how they're super hard to hit. So Yeah, because Monica Abbott mm -hmm. is a lefty as well on Team mm -hmm. USA. And are you you two are both left handed and I I'm guessing you guys gotta be what, two of the top five or ten pitchers in the world? Well, thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, seriously, we dominate softball, don't we? Be. I would love to be considered that. I mean, yeah, I think that a lot of lefties are actually considered the top pitchers right now. Um, at the USA tryouts a couple weeks ago, six out of 12 of the pitchers at the tryout were lefties. So. Well, six out of 12 were righties, too. Yeah. I mean, but it was split, though, because, you know, like, right. obviously the percentage of righties and lefties in the world is yeah. very skewed, but there was is half and half for the tryouts. So. What is that like, you know, going to tryout for Team USA? It's super competitive and it's very nerve wracking. But this year I kind of went with my mission that I've been talking about and just tried to be myself and not be too much. And I felt like I had the best tryout that I've ever had. So, nice. Yeah. How'd it go? It went really well, but I didn't make it. I wasn't really expecting to. I'm kind of a youngster. So So they like make you earn your stripes a little bit? A little bit. But I mean, I could have made it. There's a girl younger than me that did make it. But I think I have a really good shot in the future. Nice. Is your goal then to play in the Olympics? I would love to play in the next Olympics, yeah. I feel like this year it's kind of set, but I'm really excited for the future and hope that I can make the next one. Talk to me about the Chicago Bandits and the National Pro Fast Pitch League. You were the number one pick in the NPF draft a couple of years ago. What's that like being a number one pick? Like, Where were you on draft day? I was actually at the Senior Choice Awards, which is like – a an award show for Oklahoma nice. athletics and I was sitting actually in the crowd we were watching it on tv me and Paige Parker and Nicole Penley all got drafted and so we were all just watching it on a phone during it so that's where I was when I got drafted and we were all really excited we all got drafted pretty high so. awesome were you expecting to be number one I actually knew beforehand kind of oh, that I was really? going to be <laughs> yeah I'm gonna tell the truth I could lie but yeah I knew before um we had talked to the team a little bit and my coach told me that I was going to be first that's so. So cool. I was kind of prepared for it, but I still it kind of took me back. Like, I can't believe this is actually happening. So, really do cool. I have this right? You and Baker Mayfield then were both number one picks out of Oklahoma in mm -hmm. 2017. Yep. Did we were you know both Baker? Transfers, isn't that weird? Yeah. Well, a little bit. We met on my visit to Oklahoma because my brother is a huge diehard Oklahoma <laughs> fan, and so I think Coach Gasso tried to pull some strings, and she's like, "Hey, come to Oklahoma. I can bring Baker and <laughs> have everyone meet him." and well, he came to lunch that one day, but that's the only time that I really ever like, hung out with him. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It is probably neat going to a university and playing for a team with such a name brand. Yeah. Like Oklahoma, you know, people know the Oklahoma OU logo yeah. all around the world. Yeah, and it's really cool just being around people like that all the time, and it holds us all to a higher standard. Yeah. What's, the, what's playing professional softball like? Did you ever, as a kid growing up in Dallas Center Grimes, ever think you'd be playing professional softball? You know, actually I'd getting paid for I it? I would, and it's really cool. But um, I just wish that there was more exposure, and I wish there was more teams. A lot of the teams are foreign, and there's only two, like, dominantly American teams. So I just wish that there was more of an opportunity, I guess, financially and just to play in general. But I am super happy that, that I get to continue playing, and it's really fun. Is America, are we the best in the world at softball? Or what countries are better than us? Us and Japan are pretty close, God I'd say. Dang the Japanese. Yeah. And Canada and Mexico and Puerto Rico are all coming up. Actually. Puerto Rico? Yeah, they're really good. Actually, Th there's like and no Australia. Jeez. Oh, I mean, yeah. we basically, Puerto Ricans are basically Americans. So I if know. they get too good, we should there's just start counting. There's actually a couple, like, 
like white white Americans that play in Puerto Rico because of weird loopholes. Right. They're so there's some Americans that actually play for Puerto Rico. All right. Well, yeah. no wonder they're so good. I know. I'm like, whatever. Well, it's got to be fun. So what's on the agenda for 2018, 2019? We're in 2019 now I know. for Paige. Like, what's your schedule look like this year? I, well, outside of my professional career, I just started giving lessons actually last night. And I have it all booked through the end of March right now. So I'm going to be giving lessons full time and doing some camps and clinics throughout the spring. And then I'm going to head back to Chicago in the end of May. So, so. end of your season starts early June then? Yeah, early June to the middle of August. August. So. Okay. So where are you doing? Where are you doing lessons at? And and I guess you're probably booked out. So you're yeah. probably. I'm pretty much all booked out. I have just a couple slots left, but I'm just going to be giving them in Grimes, Adele, and Waukee. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So Paige, as you probably know, because I know you're a big fan of the Moonlight Graham Show, but the way we <laughs> end every episode here on the Moonlight Graham Show is with the five big questions. First question is, who is your all-time favorite teammate? Paige Parker. Page well the the Page Page combo mm-hmm. in uh, in Oklahoma got you guys a national title. Why was Paige Parker your favorite teammate over your sister? Over your sister for sa- for God's sakes. <laughs> you can't put that on me now. <laughs> but Paige Parker just welcomed me so well when I transferred. I was really nervous at first when I transferred. I didn't know how she was going to take it because it had been her team. But she was just so gracious and she just helped me become who I could be. And we just had a really good bond. I really liked her. Was having like a f- was having a friend like that. I mean, we talked about the mental side of the game. Was having a good friend like that that w- opened her arms to you right away as you transferred. Did that have a huge impact mentally, just from your comfort level of being on that team? Yeah, she just made me so comfortable. But we also pushed each other each other to be more competitive, and we were just better physically and mentally because of each other. That's awesome. Yeah. Second question: When you think back, I don't you don't remember everything that you. Uh, all of your moments playing, but when you look back on your career now and you're still playing, but when you think about softball, what's one memory you think about that reminds you of everything that you love about the game? Winning that national championship. I think that when I look back on it, it's more than just like the highest of highs. It's more overcoming those low parts of life. And within 15 months after I got hit and going through all those mental health problems, I was on the bottom of the dog pile. So I think about everything involved with the national championship. Yeah, I was thinking about this because, as I said earlier, you're probably our most decorated athlete we've ever had here on the Moonlight Graham Show. I mean, we've had Super Bowl champions, World Series champions, Olympians. Okay, that's not me. But, like, your your list of accomplishments is incredible. (laughs) And so then I got to thinking, I'm like, is is Paige even an underdog? Like, does she even fit our show? I want to be on. And then, well, exactly. But then what you just described of – overcoming, you know, getting hit in the face of the line drive and all you experience at Missouri and to overcome all of that to get to where you're at today and be this role model for little girls. You're damn right. You're a moonlight Graham. You're a (laughs) moonlighter. You're an underdog. I think that's such a cool story. Thank you. Third question. Is there anything that still that like one game that nags at you one pitch or one game that you wish you had back? Not that I can think of off the top of my head, but I, I think back to high school and just um, in the state championship my sophomore year, we got second place, and it was a really close game. And I just remember there was one pitch that this girl hit, and it was the RBI to win. So I was like, oh, dang it. But In Fort Dodge. Yeah, so that's like one thing that I always do remember, but not many games. I try to like put the bad stuff behind me. I don't want to like dwell on it. That's so. right. Always the next one, right? Yeah, Wipe it clean. Exactly. I was always taught in in college, you know, I didn't, my mental game was so bad in high school and I didn't really figure it out until college, Mm -hmm. you know, when I start getting so worked up on the mound Mm -hmm. after you give up a pitch, but I'd always wipe the rubber, Mm -hmm. you know, you wipe the rubber off, clear it off and onto the next pitch. Yeah, I always touch the dirt between pitches. So it's kind of like just wiping everything clean. Yeah. What are you most proud of? I'm most proud of who I've been able to become throughout this whole journey. And softball's given me a lot, but I think that I've just been able to take a lot of bad stuff in life and really enjoy good things now. And I feel like everything's just starting to fall into place. And I think that softball and all of my experiences, good and bad, have led me to be able to say that. That's awesome. What's the best advice you've ever received? Mm, I would say just don't be too hard on yourself. 
I have a lot of good advice I've gotten, but that's one I always take with me is just don't be too hard on yourself. Just just be you. Don't try to be too much and just be confident in who you are. I love that. Be confident in who you are. Don't be too hard on yourself. It's a tough world. You know, if you can't support yourself and you mm-hmm. can't love yourself, it's hard to, for anybody else to love you mm-hmm. too. Now we we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the third member, uh, uh, the third person yes. sitting here you in the Moonlight Graham Show studio, <laughs> is uh, boyfriend Jordan is yeah, making an appearance here. here. So uh, we got to give a shout out to Jordan. Shout How did you guys Jordan. meet? We met on Instagram. We met on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud of it. It's fine. No, I love it. I love it. And Jordan from Wisconsin. Yeah. He's packed up his stuff. Now he's living in Iowa. I know. We just got a place to rent too. So we're going to be moving in a couple of weeks. Pretty exciting. So we, three dogs we have three dogs. dogs. Okay. I was going to ask about this page because the dogs, okay. I three dogs. That. You're what? 22 years old mm-hmm. and you already got three dogs. I mean, do you need this amount of responsibility in your life? Well, it's actually kind of a strange story too. And it's kind of molded my life, I would say, but my first dog I ever adopted, I adopted him from a puppy mill and he already had really bad scarring on his lungs. He had pneumonia that they never treated. So he never got over his pneumonia and I tried to nurse him back to health and he ended up dying at one year old because of his scarred up lungs and he just couldn't breathe anymore. Oh. So after that, I kind of vowed like if I can rescue a dog and financially and it just makes sense, then I'm going to. So I got ended up getting two throughout the rest of my college career and then I kind of convinced him to get a pit bull. So... <laughs> What we are their to, names? Jake, Charlie, and Mac. Jake, Charlie. I like when people give normal names to dogs. I know that's kind of what I did. My the one that passed away is Joey, so I oh. try to I tried to keep the whole name thing going. So and he named his he named Mac after Khalil Mac because he's a big Chicago Bears fan. Oh yeah. So. Well, and you're you're a professional <laughs> athlete, just like yeah, Khalil Mac I'm in, in Chicago. Chicago. She named him Larry. <laughs> <laughs> so, what? Paige, what message would you have for, for young girls out there? You talked about it earlier. One of your your passions now is to be a mentor and to talk about mental health and to, and to uh, be a great role model for young girls. So what's your message to them as you're giving lessons? I actually said this earlier tonight, but a quote that I would give to younger girls would be that comparison is the thief of joy. So just don't compare yourself to other people. Like, it kind of goes into what I said earlier, like just be confident in who you are and don't try to be too much and you can be happy with who you are. It's okay. It's okay to be confident. It's okay to be okay with yourself. So. That is so great. I love that. Who, where did you get that advice or where did you hear that? I from? don't know. I've heard it a bunch of times. I think it's actually kind of a popular quote. I don't know, but I always, it always sticks with me. So. It's a Paige Lowry quote. Yeah, we'll just, say, it's like that Michael like Scott. That Michael Scott one, yeah. yeah. It's like, we'll just Paris start calling that. Yeah. Tumblr, Paige Lowry. So. <laughs> well, Paige, it's been an honor to have you here on the Moonlight Graham Show. Thank you so much for, you. for coming in. And Jordan, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us as well. Thanks for having me.